Hello there my friends and welcome to my beginner's guide for King Under the Mountain. I'm Icon and in this video I'm going to go over the basic gameplay. I'm going to explain how to set up a settlement of happy dwarfs and I'm going to explore and go over the content that's in this early access version already. As usual I have timestamps in the description box down below if you're looking for a topic in particular. So before we get started, let me mention the early access state of the game one more time. This right now is an alpha version, so there, this is not even a beta. So there's a lot of things that are yet to come, but there's really a lot of fun already involved, even though the game is in such a raw status. So without further ado, let's get started. The first topic that I want to talk about is the user interface because that's always a neat thing to explore before we go over the other functions of the game. So down here we see the buttons that control pretty much the most important things. We have our orders section where we can mine, chop and do all the fancy things that we need to get the ball rolling. We have the building menu where you can build all the structural things, walls, floorings, doors and all the different things. Also some furniture stuffs like pillars and wells and windmills. Over here is the zoning menu where we find our stockpiles and also the designators for certain rooms. So bedrooms, kitchens, and what, and so on. And last but not least down here is a priority tool, which allows us to set up priorities. Over here, we have menus for crafting, which allow us to uh, manage our crafting menu, uh, our crafting jobs, which is pretty cool because here we can set up target productions. So we can tell the game how many pieces of dough we want to have. Well, that's not a, a pretty uh, exciting, um, example but here wood cutting how many planks we want to have is an interesting topic so that's where you can find all these things resources menu is your ledger of the colonies in items you can click every area to see what kind of uh, item you have in that particular category right now for example seeds are a good and interesting category we see what kind of seed we have and how many of those over there, last but not least, is our settler menu where we can see their basic needs and also what kind of job is fulfilled how often. So when you click here, for example, the stonemason job, you also get a readout about who's doing that job and who's not. The last thing worth mentioning is what happens when you click one of your dwarfs. You see here a similar thing like in the settler menu, the uh, needs and such. Also, here's the job menu. These are priorities. Most prior, uh, most important job, secondary and uh, tertiary. So, it goes like this. First, he looks for mining jobs, then for farming jobs, and then for odd jobs. So, villager job means that they are going to haul stuff and whatnot. So, try to keep a couple of villagers always open. That's pretty important. Otherwise, your hauling jobs don't really get done. So the last two things I didn't talk about yet were the minimap, but there's not really much to talk about, and the time menu over here, but I felt like these were very self-explanatory user interface elements. So before we can get anything rolling here, I want to talk about farming and mining, because these are two very, very uh, elemental parts of the game and very easily done. So let's start with that mining part. Mining is pretty simple. You go into the orders area and then you select mining and then you just uh, go over there, drag and drop whatever you want to carve out. We're going to carve out a little area here because we're going to need it later. So the farming goes like that. You select the zoning tool and the farm plot tool here and after that's being done, you can drag and drop farm plots. So a basic rule of thumb according to the tutorial is that every dwarf you have needs roughly 10 farm plots to, to, to sustain himself. So that comes up with a basic necessity of 70 farm plots. So we're going to set up uh, here pieces of 20. So we're ending up with 60. 
and I'm going to do a little bit of a larger field here, so we're ending up with uh, 70 altogether. Of course, there's never anything like too much food in games like these, so don't worry about going too crazy here. Once you have set up these patches, you can click those areas, and here you can select what kind of crop should be grown. Keep in mind you only have a limited amount of seeds, so we're going to select a variety of uh, field fruits. So. We're going to sow out carrot, corn, potato, oops, and tomato. So these are the field fruits we have seeds for and can be eaten directly. All the other uh, uh, field fruits like wheat and uh, all that other stuff need either further refining or are not meant for consumption at all, like for example hemp is not meant to be eaten, it's meant to be uh, woven into linen. So as you see here, now after we've set up these things, my dwarves begin to till the soil. Up here they have uh, started to dig, out, to dig out the mountain. Everything's good. So that covers up these topics, but to really make these uh, farms be farms, we need something more. And that's hidden behind the zones menu. So we're going to talk about zones here while we're at it. So the first part we're going to need to cover up here in the zoning area is the stockpile zones. So for our dwarfs to sow out the fields, we're going to need a particular stockpile where the seeds will reside. In this game, it's like that. Everything which is not in a stockpile is not being recognized as present by your dwarves. So basically, as long as there is no seed stockpile zone, they don't they won't be able to sow out anything because they won't be able to realize that you have seeds. So stockpile zones therefore are vital. So I'm going to set up another stockpile for raw materials right over here. Raw materials are for example these uh stone boulders here that are byproduct of our digging and uh, uncut trees and such things these are all going into the raw material stockpile other things that you're going to need in the stockpile zone are products this is everything processed wooden planks cut stone iron ingots and a plentitude of other items and also very, very important, the tools stockpile. Because at the beginning, you start out with a really high amount of various items, but like I mentioned before, if it's not in a stockpile, your silly dwarves don't know that it's there. The last important thing is the food stockpile. I'd recommend you to set it down somewhere near your farms, because this is where your harvested grains will be put into. So we're going to set up another mining job here while we're at it because that's one thing i can't recommend enough start living in the mountain as quick as possible building rooms outside is a lot harder than building them just inside the mountain so that's how you set up storage zones but for room zones because that's what this menu can do as well. It works a little bit different and we're going to go over that topic now as the next point. Rooms and furniture. So I'm going to set up one kitchen as an example of how rooms work and furniture stuffs in that regard. So we're going to select the kitchen here and drag and drop the zone over this room. There we go. And now you see there's this blue border around that. And when we click in there, that's our kitchen. So when you click the furniture button there, you see now all, all manner of different items that can be put into your kitchen. That's true for every other of these rooms. It works like that. You plot down the room designator and then you can click the tile and see what kind of items you can build in there. Right now, the tooltips are sometimes present sometimes they are not it's a little bit of a gamble for some rooms it, they are present and for some they are not to get the tooltips i i have to hover into the background of those uh, tiles and not onto the tile itself and sometimes it just starts bugging out well alpha status so i'm not taking this too serious what your place will need though is one water barrel because you know water is important for kitchen stuff one kitchen worktop, because that's where your uh, cooks will cook your stuff. And one cauldron, because that's where 
the put stuff from the worktop will be put into. The other items in here, the butcher workshop and the baker's worktop and, and so on, we're going to cover them a little bit later. Another thing that's worth mentioning, as you see here, I have a little bit of a nose here left over. I just select the kitchen zone, select the add tile function, and then I can just add extra things in there. And that's how you set up rooms, and that's how you bring up furniture for those. This is a basic functionality which works like that in the entire game. As you see here, these ghosts of those buildings tell you what kind of resources they need. Here is a steel cauldron necessary for the cauldron. Here the kitchen worktop needs marble blocks. We have a pretty large stockpile of blocks and such to begin with as kind of a starting equipment, so you don't need to worry about that too much. Also, every one of your dwarves carries around a whole inventory of rock bread ration, uh, rations, so you don't need to worry about food too much, but I highly recommend you to set up some food replenishment as quick as possible. Okay, so now you know how to set up rooms in general. Let's get to the next topic and that's going to be crafting. So crafting is be work is being well crafting is being made in rooms always. You can't craft without a room. So we're going to set up the most basic forms of crafting here today. That's the masonry workshop and the wood mill. So for, for now, I'm going to set up the masonry workshop somewhere outside. I'd highly recommend you not to. Instead, you should always put these uh, things under the into a room, but for now, for the sake of the tutorial's quickness, we're going to do this. So, as you see here, the uh, masonry workshop only has a stone mason workbench. There's no other piece of furniture possible. Also worth mentioning, furniture can always be made out of different types of materials. You can select here the type of material and then what kind of particular material should be used. So we're placing down the stone mason workbench ghost here. And as you see here, it's waiting for the resources to arrive. Marble blocks, iron hammers, tin chisels and so on. So you start out with a nice stockpile of these things, so you don't need to worry about these too much. So, next thing on the list is we're going to set up a sawmill, because that's what you're going to need to process wood. Works the same, set up a woodcutting bench in there, and you're good to go. And now you have the first workbench done. So when you click that, you see there's a menu here. Click into the crafting menu and here, lo and behold, the real crafting menu. So this is the whole job menu of your stone masonry bench. Goes like this. Blocks. The game will try to maintain 300 blocks. You see how many you have in total. And here you see what kind of material should be used to produce these blocks. Right now, it would use any stone boulder to uh, create those blocks. You can, of course, tell the game to uh, select a particular stone boulder to, sell, to create blocks out of. Next one, creating gears. The colony tries to maintain a total amount of five gears, and it will do these out of all manner of different stone blocks, and so on and so forth. You always see what kind of item is tried to be produced in advance for future projects. So, as you see here, there are a couple of things we don't own yet, and I highly recommend you to uh, turn off everything at the beginning that doesn't make any sense to you. So for example here I only keep the gem cutting on because I really don't know whether or not we're going to need gears, millstones, pipes in the next time. But I do know that I want to have these stone blocks for other projects. So I don't want to have them wasted. At the beginning right now the game gives a has a really well thought through um, base inventory that these uh, workbenches try to uh, keep alive here. This all makes sense, believe me, but sometimes it's better to deactivate it with that priority button and turn it on when you really start to need it, unlike or otherwise you'll just be wasting materials like crazy. So 
Now this table will automatically process these uh, raw, uh, these uh, stone boulders into fresh blocks and then they get transported down here. The wood cutting bench works pretty similar. As you can see here, it processes logs and mushroom logs into planks. There's nothing we need to configure there. But to get logs, well, you guessed it already, you need to chop trees. Boom. That's how it, works. That's how it works. So that's how you set up basic crafting processes but that's well the game is a little bit more complicated that's why we're going to into crafting plus here so crafting plus these are a uh, little bit more sophisticated uh, rooms so <clears throat> while the masonry workshop and the the sawmill were pretty basic things let's go into something like the metalworks as an example of how things are working out when you're going into advanced uh, crafting processes. As I mentioned before, try to put these rooms under the mountain, not outside like I do it here. Take your time with expanding slowly and carving out these rooms, it's worth it. So, metalworks. At the metalworks, we're going to set up an ore crushing, crushing station first. That's where the ore will be transformed into crushed ore. Then, we're going to set up a bloomery furnace, which will transform the crushed ore into bloom. And then... Wait a sec. Oh, no, we're... Sorry. We're, this turns uh, crushed ore into ingots already. I, I was uh, wrong about that. This uh, station here creates the bloom already. So, you put in ores, and then you have this one for... Like, no, the furnace creates bloom, and then you need. Sorry, now I. Ah, now I uh, confused myself. So, once more, with more sense. Ore crushing, crushed ore, bloomery furnace creates bloom, and then down goes at last the last thing, the furnace, uh, the forge, where you will transform the bloom into ingots. Finally. So that's a pretty complicated uh, chain of uh, products already, and it or it all gets worse when we check this out. So it's not that hard. So here the ore crushing is pretty simple. It's just taking any uh, form of crushed ore, uh, of uh, ore. It's trying to maintain a total amount of crushed ore of 400, but here any ore transformed into crushed ore. The uh, bloomery furnace has a simple, has a similar uh, setup. It tries to transform any crushed ore into bloom, but it also needs fuel, and that's where things get a little bit more complicated. You have here two ways of doing it. Either you look for these uh, bituminous coal ore stones and you set up in your furnace area a coke oven, which will transform that bituminous coal into coke, which you can use as a fuel for a uh, source. Or you go over here, create an earthworks, earthworks zone, and plot it down and create a charcoal clamp, which will transform 32 logs into charcoal. So you can select your uh, to uh, do your own like according to your own situation which kind of fuel source is good for you. And to acquire ores, you need to go around and check it out. So the mountains are full of treasures. Everything which is written in this light bluish color can sometimes yield a uh, a tooltip if you're lucky telling you what the stuff is good for. This is where, well, the game is very, very uh, early access. So there's gold ore, wonderful. So you can mine that out. And then these ores will get transported into your furnace. So we're going to set up one coke oven here. And as you can see here, my dudes are already transporting the logs into the charcoal clamp. So since I want that to be done really quickly, I can do the priority button here. You can also use the priority button for mining jobs, as a matter of fact. So there's really a couple of cool usages there. So here goes native gold ore. And now 
they're crushing the coal ore into coke to use that at the coke oven. Another thing which is really important if you want to go for these advanced uh, processes is also set up the right stockpile zone. So for example here we need a fuel zone to uh, stockpile these fuels afterwards so everything will work out. And that's how you produce all manner of different uh, ingots and such. So right now we're not getting anything done because the forge is not getting done but the forge does work very similar like the other crafting tables I've shown to you. And the other rooms here feature similar process chains. So for example the brewery here features the malting station where you will transform the barley into malt, then the mash tun, then the brew kettle and then the fermentation tank. They usually go into in the in the order that they show up or another example here would be the the uh, textile workshop where you first uh, transform the hemp into uh, some usable fibers and then the loom to ultimately transform those fibers into linen and rope and this this is how it works in this game and that covers up pretty much all the systems once you have understood these things you've understood how to craft everything in this game so the kitchen has the same thing here gristmill baker's worktop baker's oven gristmill transforms the wheat into flour baker's worktop transforms the flour into dough baker's oven transforms the dough into bread that that's as it works right now and well this is pretty much all that I can explain right now. So as the last part, let's talk about the early access status and I want to do a little bit of a summary so far. So, well, right now the game is absolutely peaceful. There are no outside threats. The only threat that can occur is your people growing too unhappy and your people um, starving to death. These two things are really the only uh, threats that your people have. Ultimately you want to have sleeping rooms for every of your dwarves, one room for everybody. You can set up a massive uh, fortress here in the mountain already, but it all doesn't have any deeper forms of progression right now. What I do enjoy though is I didn't run into any particular bad bugs or, or anything really horrible. All the errors that I've ran into so far were my own fault because I did misunderstand something. Really, really big uh, thumbs up on that department. What so far is extremely lacking in this version is user interface clarity. So it's really hard to see who's doing which job. And not only is it hard to see, well, okay, you can't see that by, by these things, but it's also, well, I need to click here to configure the jobs. I'm pretty sure that you will see some betterment in the future with these things, because honestly, alpha version. So really, not nothing to worry about. But that's what that was something that these were things that bothered me the most while while exploring the game but beyond that the only problem that this game had so far for me was that it wasn't done and that the user interface has severe uh, shortcomings with tooltips and uh, quality of life things for example when you want to chop a tree you can't chop directly by clicking it you always have to bring up the, the chopping tool which isn't accessible by a hotkey or at least it's not easily discernible where the hotkey is and so on and so forth and stuff like for example that the workshops produce all manner of funky things and eat up your resources if you're new to the game these things can be pretty confusing as well but beyond that this game is already pretty wonderful and i can't wait to see where it will go so yeah that's pretty much everything i had to say for this beginner's guide i hope that was helpful for you drop your comments down below if you have any questions or if you felt like i have missed out a spot which is really important add it in i'd be really grateful of course leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel if you enjoy that kind of content i do daily videos so all you need to do is hit that notification button and last but not least, in the description box, you'll also find links to my Twitch channel where I do daily streams, or at least I try to, my Discord 
community where you can find like-minded gamers and also links for the direct support of my channel. I'd be delighted if you check them out, but if you don't, don't you worry too much. Watching this video to this point and listening to all that already means a terrible lot to me. Have a wonderful day and see you soon, I hope. Bye-bye.